hip hop right now at this stage, it it's punk looking, but it didn't reach the punk representation responsibility. Punk music was always anti-government, anti-establishment. Let's get our things together and let's come together. I'm not mad at the, the, this generation of rappers for what they do, because I can never critique another person's creativity. I'm mad at them for what they don't do. I don't care about any other genre of entertainment. There's a responsibility with hip hop. Hey, welcome back to For The Record. I'm your host, Rob Markman. Now, you know on this show here at Genius, we always talk about music and we talk about culture. Now, last night I was home watching HBO. I was watching The Deuce. And, you know, it's all about 42nd Street and the hustle that was going on in New York City in the late 70s, moving into the early 80s. And it really just made me think about this time in music when, when everything was fresh and brand new. We started to see the birth of hip hop. We saw disco. We saw punk. I just wanted to have a conversation about it, so I brought some friends with me that I want to introduce. First up, we have my man, Anwan Glover, actor extraordinaire, who was actually in the first season of The Deuce yes, as sir. Leon. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me, man. Okay, man. Next up, we have a hip-hop legend, a music icon, Daryl DMC. What's going on, What's my happening? brother? It's good to be in a place to be. Yes, sir. And congratulations on your last project, your EP, Back From The Dead, The yes. Legend Lives. This is in stores now on vinyl, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Amazing, man. Great to have you. And last but not least, man, this is my guy, man, from New York Mag, the music critic, the king of the hot takes. You've seen him on Twitter. You either love or hate his opinions. It's probably the latter. But there's like nobody who knows the history of music like this guy, my man Craig Jenkins, man. What's I up? I appreciate you having me on, gentlemen. Great to meet you. Glad to be. Nah, that's what's up, man. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, I just want to kind of get right into it. Uh, Anwan, I, I, I think you can start because... You know, in watching The Deuce, you see how New York used to be. Um, and a lot of people, if you go to 42nd Street now, almost unrecognizable when you watch this show. So just, just kind of set up what The Deuce is. You're on season one, you play Leon, you own Leon's Diner. Set up the premise of the show and, and kind of the music and how the music fits into this series. What is the, like, the 70s... Um based on uh, prostitution, extortion, gambling. Amazing show. You catch it first season. Like with the music, you know, you got the jukebox. You got Leon's, it's like everybody's coming in, jumping right into it, you know. I'm familiar with all the pimps come in. You know, you got male people, you everyday workers come in. You know what I mean? And the music is, it's like the old school. You know what I mean? Like with the 70s. You know what I mean? You got James Brown, like all the old hip records, Marvin Gaye, things of that nature. Like people come in, you know their orders. I know exactly what you want as soon as you come in. It's a home place. Everybody comes in. And like with the deuce, it hits back there, like you said, 42nd Street. It's, it's just like amazing because they captured everything from back then. And like with, with the sounds and like the cars, the old clothes, the bushes, everything. Like it's 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 like crazy, man. You gotta see it if who haven't tuned in yet. Yeah, like, nah, it's amazing it's, show. It's definitely dope to see, and it, and it makes you think. It's almost unbelievable. Like I said, if you didn't live in that time or have like your OGs who kind of put you on. Um, DMC, man, you came up in that time. I know that time, and speaking with you and just knowing your history, late seventies, yeah, very influential for what you went on to do in your career yes, as, as, as one third of Run DMC along with um, Rest in Peace, Jam Master J. Uh -huh. um, can you talk about this time that we're talking about? We're really talking about the late 70s. Uh -huh. Like New York was a different place. Uh -huh. Musically, there were different things going on. Kind of paint that picture. What was going on there? Well, in New York City in the 70s, it was ill. But musically, the blessing that we had was radio. 70s radio, this was a, there was a station here called um, 77 WABC. And I think the guy, Dan Ingram, passed away like three months ago. But I remember be, being a little kid playing with my toys and stuff like that. And I used to always hear, Dan in it. And I used to think it was a horn blast. But my father would always have it on 77 WABC. But that was the singer shouting out, Dan Ingram. And the reason why that is relevant because that station, they played Soul. They played Sly and the Family Stone. They played James Brown. 
They played the Jackson 5, but they also played Jim Croce, Harry Chapin. They also played the Beatles, and they also played the Stones and Led Zeppelin and all that. So radio was very diverse. There was no playlist. It was like if it was a folk song that was hot, if it was a funk song that was hot. And you had the stations, the other stations, the black station, they, they was playing the soul, the funk, and the disco. So in the streets at that time, though, the, the thing that was happening in the 70s was that people thought New York City outside of 42nd Street was paradise. And what I mean by that was it was the deuce, which was hell, and it was Studio 54, which was heaven. And it was always on the TV. So I don't care what part of the country you was in, when you saw Studio 54, you saw the celebrities and the athletes. Hollywood was leaving LA, coming to New York City to party at Studio 54. So the perception was, yo, it's all good in New York City. You know what I'm saying? But unless you walked on 42nd Street, you knew that that wasn't true. But the thing with Studio 54 was you had all this music playing on these stations, and you had all the disco on Studio 54, and everybody's perception that, you know, life was good. And if you're on the outside looking in at Studio 54, you're seeing the fur coats, you're seeing the Rolls Royces, you're seeing the champagne, you're seeing the sex, um, you're seeing the drugs, and you're seeing that party lifestyle. So if you wasn't able to get into Studio 54, you know what I'm saying? You was kind of alienated from that goodness. So all you really had was 42nd Street. And, and for us, especially the younger kids, even though 42nd Street was hell, 42nd Street was like our amusement park. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yo, we're going to get some dog. No, it wasn't even that. You ain't had no money. You just sneak on a train, you sneak on a bus, and you just go to 42nd Street and you take in whatever it was. If you was a little longer, one of your main reasons for going to the Deuce is to play in the arcades. Remember, they used to have the arcade yeah, places there. Absolutely. Or you're going to go sneak in the porno joints. You know what I'm saying? You're just going to run in the front joints. <laughs> or you're going to go up there, you're going to put your little bit of money together, you're going to get some night train, you're going to get some wild hour strolls, you're going to get, this is before 40 ounces, right. you're going to get a quarter old English, and you're going to find a loose joints. But the music that was going on was definitive for us to express ourselves. We took all the music that existed at that time and recycled it so that we could tell our stories and tell our adventures. You know, Craig, man, um, I, you know, I want to get at as, as the research that you've done in your career and as a music critic, talk about this because what, what, what DMC says is, is, is true, right? On, on the TV you saw Studio 54, but there's inner city kids who are dealing with a harsh reality in New York. Talk about how that time kind of birth hip hop and, and spawn records like you know if you think about like run dmc hard times if you think about grandmaster um flash and message. another message you know um planet rock we, we start oh, getting real reports of what's going on in the street once we pass the glitz and glamour kind of talk about that shift well you know it was kids uptown nothing to do no infrastructure bombed out city and so they were out in the streets and so what they found to do is they found that they could rap and they found that they could get together and make cyphers and they found that they could jack power and you know, get into the sound systems and stuff. And so basically, you know, it's just like you know, inner city entrepreneurialism, you know, kids figuring out to make a way for themselves, and that's the birth of the thing. That's dope. Cause cause well, let me add to that. Cause what had happened was everybody was like, yo, New York City must be heaven and stuff like that. But then when you think about how powerful the, the beginnings of hip hop was, it's like the news channels and the newspapers wasn't writing about the bombed out cities, you know what I'm saying? It was like a war zone. Like even Harlem back, if you go to Harlem now, it's Harlem. Right, right. You know, it's been a rented house, but back in the day, Harlem was Harlem. It was you know empty streets, it was streets it was with nothing empty in empty streets, so, you know, it took young kids who, in, in, in death, despair, and darkness, it took young kids to look inside of themselves and to, utilize you know the music that was being created by all these great musicians and great artists but it took them to figure out yo i got something in me i need a way for my story to be told you know what i'm saying they always on studio 54 they always writing about the deuce but here on my block you know i'm living 42nd street life every day so it was just genius that we was able to take that music we took the disco you know what i'm saying wherever there's a break in the music that's where we're going to get our little two cents in. The and classic Ryan got the Aerosmith shirt on? Yeah, yeah, Toys in the Attic. It's crazy because I didn't even know that the song was Walk This Way. I just knew, get 
the album with the toys out and play number four so I can run my mouth. But coming out of that, it took a record like The Message to let this whole nation know Studio 54 ain't how it really is. This, the, you see the deuce? This 42nd Street lifestyle is almost on every street corner in the Bronx, in the Manhattan, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, you know, I, I want to get to, that's a great point. I want to get to Anwar um, a little bit because not only are, are, are you an actor, I mean, brother, you're so just multifaceted and talented, also a musician. Yes. Came up in DC where, where the culture was a little bit different, go go. But talk about you coming up in that time and the things that you were seeing in DC versus the perception of what was going on in New York and musically how that all made sense. It's like DMC said, um, Studio 54, we had like, you had the Lincoln Theater, Ben's Chili Bowl, you had the Break Dancers, you had uh, Chuck Brown, Sugar Bear with EU, that did the thing with Do The Right Thing with Spike Lee. It was a go-go swing with hip hop. Also, Junkyard was signed to Def Jam with DMC, so they was doing the tougher than leather thing. And we were kids, we were coming up, and it was like, it was just this big fade, just like with hip hop. And we were in love with the music with the go-go swing touch to it. So like in my city, like the murder rate and the whole nine yards with that, and we was just little kids. They had the Lincoln Theater where you can watch the movies all day for $5. You know what I mean? And that, with that whole culture, with the whole Chocolate City thing, with the regentrification, it's changed so much. But as you go back and you look at the deuce, on how they reenact that whole situation. Like with 42nd Street and how they put it, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's just like, it's, it's crazy. Mm. Talk about the power of, again, in that time, we're talking about poverty. New York just wasn't what it was, right? Um, and again, when you turn on the TV, you saw the glamour and the glitz. A lot of times with disco, which was very popular at the time that we're talking about, you heard the glamour and the glitz. But people were going through real pain at that time. And musically, you weren't supposed to or weren't allowed, or I don't know if the record companies were signing it, but to express yourself. Like, t talk about the boiling over, the frustration of, of, of people, and, and we see it in the deuce again with, with people who are just hustling and going through hard times. That can only go on for so long until you burst and, and, and this frustration comes out or, or this... I'm going to tell my truth. I'm not going to tell well, you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you how it is. Well, when you, if you look at the record, the message, it was a, even, look, it took some young people to tell the truth. But if you listen to the message, it wasn't just about hip hop. The message spoke on what the adults, our mothers, our fathers and aunts and uncles were feeling. Hardworking people struggling in the ghettos, in these, you know, lower... Um, class communities. Even though it came from us when we were young b-boys, we were trying to speak for our parents. You know, all these, these young people, we were looking at our mothers. We were looking at single parent households. We were looking at, you know, the teachers struggling, the educational system. And then we sitting around and we're looking like, yo, man, the religious people and the politicians ain't really telling the truth. So we took it upon ourselves to say, yo, let's take these beats, let's take this music, and let's tell the stories that we see our people, you know what I'm saying? This, our generation is struggling. So, you know what was beautiful about hip hop? I don't know, this New York was just the presentation of it, but it's the same way people felt down South. It's the same way people in Watts felt. It's the same way people in Compton felt. But when you look at the, um, when you look at the presentation of it, you know, you see 42nd Street, you see Studio 54, and you see where all of these emotions and feelings is coming from. So for us as little people, young people, nobody was talking to us in a language that we can understand. So, you know, whether you think that hip hop was illiterate or whether you thought it was a fad or whether you thought it was some hip hop mumbo jumbo, at that time, people was overlooking the important historical social, socioeconomic reporting that we were doing. And the way that we did it was, it was simple. What the hell is going on? Let's talk about it. What the hell is going on? Let's talk about it. So um, the message comes out and the whole world was like, oh shoot, so New York ain't Studio 54. Not, not the land it's of milk like, and honey. Yeah, it's like every ghetto then. But then a brilliant thing happened. Africa, Bambana, and the Zulu Nation, 
they did Planet Rock. And what Planet Rock did was, it says, okay, yes, because remember when the message came out, every hip-hop record, hip-hop does it all the time. Every hip-hop record after the message, because the message was so successful, was a message record. Right. It was message one, message two, message three. Life in the ghetto, growing up in the ghetto. Try to, every, go back to that time. Times is hard. We're struggling. So Bam them had enough sense to say, okay, here's where we are now. It's, it's true. This is broken glass everywhere. But here's where we could go. Right. We know a place. You know, it was a vision record. There's a place called Planet Rock where everybody's eating. There's not going to be crime and stuff like that. So that gave hip hop, that gave our generation um, some um, enthusiasm of, hey, maybe it can be better. That's why you had all of these, you know, Run DMC, LL, Public Enemy, Karis One, and all, you know, Schooly D. You know what I'm saying? Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. So now you got the young people in these situations doing the actual day-to-day -day commentary of what was going on. But the point I'm trying to make is we were speaking for our mothers and fathers because we saw them struggling. Because our mothers, fathers, and uncles was the grown-ups and the young people going to his diner that, see, to that, do yes, everything. Yes, that, 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 <laughs> My uncle was coming to his diner to plan out, that, well, we going to sell this heroin, we're going to get uh, these holes. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a little kid, seven years old. I'm watching Uncle Billy and I'm go down to his diner yeah. to do that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So we was like living this thing. You, you make an excellent point because that's that's exactly where I was going to go next. It's like kind of you, if you watch the deuce and, and, and you know, not a true story, but based off of like just a, a it's real true lifestyle. Though. That's so how like, down. these were stories. Yeah. And you know what it is is the kids of the characters in the show, if you imagine that the show continues to go on five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve seasons, will eventually become the hip hop generation. Exactly. And the punk generation. And the punk generation. It would change, it would change up. Mm -hmm. It's like we watch your parents, like you said, watch watch our mother. I used to watch my mom come home. And our favorite day of the week was Friday, because she'll work hard, three jobs, and we know we eating fish on Friday. <laughs> and she'll come in there, no, no, no dad in the household, my sister washing clothes, hanging it out on the on the line, and we listen to music. My mom always played the 45 records, and she played records, and we'd see her cry sometime. Right. We're like, damn, what, what? But she'd never tell us why what she was records? Crying. What records was she playing? Man, Gladys Knight, Dionne Ward. Yeah, that's why. Man, you know what I mean? All, all, all kind of old, man, flagship, all kind of old records. You know what I mean? But like, my mama just like, she was a strong lady. You know what I mean? So she did what she had to do, you know what I mean? To make ends meet. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, when I, 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 I go back and I, when I watch The Deuce, it just like reminds me of those days back with my grandfather, my uncles, and seeing my father in Spurks. He'd come around penitentiary, be back out, locked back up, tight pants, you know what I mean? Come in with leather jacket. Drop some stuff on the table and he gone. The tight you know pants I mean? is back, by the way. I just yeah, the tight pants. Back. Back. Tight pants Too back. much though. <laughs> it's it's, 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 it's what I'm saying. Like you know, the like goes. With, with DMC was like saying with the arcades, it was the same way in DC. They had the the, the pimps and the hoes up and down 14th Street, mm -hmm. and we were little kids. Like we want to watch that on the bike, the peep yeah. shows, and the whole thing. So man, it's just like to bring that and to have that music right there and really to be a part of the show. It's like amazing, bro. It's like a dream. Like, wake up. Craig, Craig I, I want to throw this to you because one of the things I love to do, I, I think hip hop is, is old enough in this generation, our audiences. Nobody wants to listen to what their parents listen to. A lot of times, kids don't understand why a record's older than them. They want to do their thing. Um, but there's a connection here, and I want to make this connection. When, when DMC talks about the message, to me at the time, that's frustration in the youth. That speaks to mental health. Like and, and I think a big thing that's going on in, in hip hop right now, Craig, I want you to speak to this, is a lot of young rappers and musicians talking about their own mental health, their own feelings, and and their frustration and, and, and drugs and all of that. We validate them, but it's nothing new. Talk about kind of the connection of the message and how that was an important record and, and kind of parallels to what's going on right now. Well, you know, I mean, we were always talking about mental health, I think. We just didn't really have the specific language for it. But you know now there's there's you know bigger better tools you know for therapy and to figure out you know what's going on inside of our heads. You're getting records like you know you're getting kids like Logic. It's cyclical like the you know the problems that push us into hip hop culture don't disappear. But just like the ways that we talk about it, you know because those things are the same over generations, like you know always sticks around. And, and, and it makes sense because again if we're, if we're talking about again early '70s pimps, prostitution, heroin was big. 
was, was a big drug um, back then. Coke back was, now, was a big drug. Opioids, <laughs> heroin, all that. I'm saying it's back so, around. Spend around. Right, and, and, and so it, it births kind of that first generation of hip hop artists. But one of the things that's interesting to me is the artists today are, are the kids of, of the crack era that we grow this. So, yeah. so you really see how, how the drugs and what's going on in the street affects the music. What's going on in around. our society affects the music a couple of years later. Because yeah. those are the children's of that. Because, you know, we was growing up, we was listening to, you know, Re- our parents were listening to Aretha Franklin and Gladys right. and stuff like that. Piece, and piece. I always remember those nights in the 70s where, you know, we forget that our parents were cool, that they had New Year's Eve parties and Christmas the parties thing. and Thanksgiving. And they said, boy, get your ass back up in that room because you would come to the side of the steps and look like you try to check yeah, it out. Yeah. Get your ass back up in the room. But it's crazy how... When you look back at that time, though, you know, look at what James Brown did for 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 our communities. You know what I'm saying? When there was riots, they they stepped up. Uh, Marvin Gaye, even though he was a sexy soul love man, he did a record called "What's, What's Going, Going On." on so us as being children of a generation, when we did get in hip hop for show business and you know to get money for reasons, um, for you know for for personal reasons. We never forgot what the forefathers did. You was talking about that earlier, like how you look up to Scarface and what they did. So we know, okay, we can be the greatest MCs on the face of the earth with the big gold Doremes and the Mercedes Benz, but we got a responsibility. What was going on at 42nd Street, we saw that it was possible we could have that Studio 54 life, but we knew we had to get it in a positive way way where we can all relate what we're feeling in a positive, safe way. So when you really look at all the early rap records, you got to really think how brilliant these records were. You know what I'm saying? The message, Planet Rock, like I tell kids, to this day, I mean, for for what it be, uh, Rolling Stone magazine, I think, said the message is the greatest rap song ever. Not just because it's, you know, not because it ain't as, as dope as Eminem, or, or, or as fantastic as Jay-Z or, or, or as incredible as Jada Kiss or Nas and anybody, put that record on and listen to it. It's a perfect demonstration of what we did from the parks. You know, Chuck D said we took nothing and created something out of it. But when you think about it, we took all of these elements that people thought had no worth. And we took our mother's and father's music and we took the foundation that they gave to us and we put our life experience on it, and we left it for the listener to share it. And if you think about it, hip hop at every at every um, at every generation, hip hop is always a culmination of the OGs and the young Gs. Think about that. It's a culmination of the OGs and the young Gs. Run DMC. We was only successful because we was trying to impress the funky four plus one, the treacherous three and the cold crust four MCs. You know what I'm saying? They said, this is how you should do it. And for me as a kid, I grew up in Queens. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, and I, 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 go to, I go to the worst ghettos and I speak to the kids. I, I went to Catholic school my whole life. You know what I'm saying? So every school that I went to, my mother and father worked their asses off to pay for me to go to. I was a straight A student. I lived in Queens. I had a backyard. I had a fence. You know what I'm saying? My father mowed the lawn. Um, my father had the poor man's Cadillac, the electric 225 from back in the <laughs> 70s and stuff like that. We took the experience of 42nd Street and we turned it into our own Studio 54. Right. So all of those elements are relevant. You know, like even now, people always ask me, I'm not mad at the, the, this generation of rappers for what they do. Because I can never critique another person's creativity. I'm mad at them for what they don't do. And what I mean is, there's a when it, I don't care about any other genre of entertainment. There's a responsibility with hip hop. There's a responsibility to hip hop to do what those individuals before you, you don't have to do it, but set it up so somebody else can. That's why we have always had um, elevation. Hip hop was only good because we stole Parliament Funkadelic's music, Aerosmith's music. You know what I'm saying? We stole the disco music from, from the Neon you know? jukebox and the Donna. From the ju- yeah, you go in the jukebox. Listen, we listening to Donna Summer. We listening to the Trance. We listening to the Four Top. And did, you know this. You know this. Every rap group in the beginning was a disco name. The di- the Fat Boys was the Disco Three. Yeah. The disco. Every rap group. I'm the disco man of the. I'm the. We wanted to be there. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Our only problems were we had no resources. What's resources? Money and real estate. 
So our disco was the parks. But think about that, being in, in the middle of the park, doing a, a, a block party or a park party up in the Bronx or in Manhattan on, at, at um, you know, um, uh, Cretona Park in the Bronx, which is about, what, a 25-minute train ride from 42nd Street at that time. So now you're getting all these individuals coming here. It's familiar because we're rapping over the music our mothers and fathers used to play. And my joke is this. When we started our block parties in Queens, the neighborhood hated it. The neighborhood hated it. They was calling the police on us every day. These, they, these young people are making all this racket, but check it out. All that changed when the lady that was calling the cops continued. They're playing my favorite Marvin Gaye, my Marvin Gaye song. <laughs> so now, oh, because we playing your music, we cool now. Now we could play it. You know what I'm saying? So like you said, it's, it's all connected. People always ask me, what do you think about hip hop right now? Hip hop right now at this stage, it, it's punk looking but it didn't reach the punk representation responsibility. Punk music was always anti-government, anti-establishment, let's get our things together and let's come together. Right now, hip hop is in this disco stage. And I say, mm. you say, DMC, what do you mean? Pink fur coats, Bentleys, champagne. Go look at 70s disco and go look at a hip hop video right now. Mm. All the way to the it's not gonna turn time. punk until they start talking about, like. Karis One, we've been doing that since we was 12. Chuck D been doing it, Run DMC been making it like that since we was 12. These guys now, they're in their disco stage. It's a lot of money, it's the number one music globally. They got all of these, they got more champagne than God can fucking um, make on, on the green earth, they got all of this. But if you listen to the music outside of J. Cole, Kendrick, um, Logic, Logic said, yeah. the guys on the mainstream front, they're not talking government. Right. They're not talking education. So my thing is this, you can have a record full of strip clubs songs, but where's that one hip hop record using a funk, a punk, a folk, or an old beat from the 90s saying, don't shoot the gun. All the records are shoot the gun, drink, let's have sex. So right now hip hop is finally, okay, it's in this disco stage. Remember, I was a little kid and I woke up one day, it was overnight, I went to sleep and I woke up, the whole world was saying disco sucks. Remember how, it didn't come on gradually. I went to bed one day, day. <laughs> disco was huge. I went to bed one day and woke up all over America, disco sucks. They wasn't tired of the music. They was tired of the lifestyle that was be thrown in our okay. face. So Especially when the reality of, of most people were, were things that- Blondie you, you made a rap about. song. Right. So Blondie's punk audience was like, what the hell is a Grandmaster Flash and who the hell is a Fab Five Freddy? So Blondie kind of was like a, 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 um, an extension of, yo, check this out. Right. People didn't know what hip hop was, but Blondie knew because in the 70s and early 80s, if you would have came to New York City and you walked into any club, oh shoot, there goes Keith Haring. Oh shoot, there goes Running Them. Oh shoot, there goes the Beastie. Oh, there goes Basquiat. Oh shoot, there goes Fat Fat Freddy. There yo. was a convergence of the art scene, and, art and, and, scene. And, and the punk scene and the hip hop scene. Did, yeah, exactly. Um, and and well, I, I want to end with you. I want to put you on the spot a little bit. I mean, you know, we're talking about the dudes. Um, I'm learning a lot right now, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Like I received the sermon. Me too. Hey, like, bro, I, I'm, I'm right here. I got, a, I got my whole, I just caught a lot of passes right now. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's a, that, that, that's why I, Daryl, man, I'm so grateful oh, to have man. you here. Who you man. telling, you're the bro? Perfect. And, and and really, the, the but whole it's panel. all connected because yeah. it, it it didn't like it, it didn't start to happen to me till I was like six or seven years into the the business of hip hop mm -hmm. when I started realize oh the connect oh that's why that does that you know I had to get into it to experience it but you know people that experience hip hop. You don't have, like you said, you don't, you didn't have to be a rapper to be hip hop. Right. You, I don't. You, you hip, you're and, not rappers or DJs. And, and you but still we're don't. all connected because of our experience. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? And, and well, I, I want to end with you, man. Um, I, I really enjoy Leon's character in season one. I, I hope to see you in season two, man. I, I'm, I'm praying to the HBO guys. I want you to channel Leon and help me out. I want to put together a playlist of maybe what was going on in that jukebox. Give me like, like. Yeah. Four or five records, man, that man, I can that's, play. Uh, that, that what's, what, uh, what's going on? Um, Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye. Uh, let me see. Uh, James Brown. Um, let me see. I put him on the spot too. I had to. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying. Um, let me see. Uh, Donna Summer. You gotta Donna throw some Donna Summer. Summer in you there. got Donna yeah. Summer. Give me one more. Throw me one more. 
Mm. We, got, we got James Brown, we got Curtis Marvin Gaye. Curtis Mayfield. Oh, of, of, of course, Curtis Mayfield. You got Gladys Knight. I got to go back. See, I, I was born at the tail end of 79. So okay. I, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, brother. And it's really for my own selfish reasons now. <laughs> nah, that's because cool. I, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm hey, learning man. from you guys. Well, I, rem- I, I remember go the record that just totally took over every street was. Um, what was the band? Um, Average right band play that funky music, okay. White Boy. Oh yeah, that. When yeah. that dropped, man, that was like when Slick Rick, Slick Rick dropped Lottie Dottie. I remember everywhere that was really hot in the streets. I, I know we know that record and now. Curtis, that really, and was Curtis crazy. Mayfield though. Yeah. Like it was a lot heavy Curtis Mayfield because he had that. Man, that's what everybody was playing in the Cadillacs back then. Yeah. Boom, doom, 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 doom. All of, you know what I mean? Those hits. I'm just soaking this whole thing up like being but beside this legend right here, man. It's like. Cause you see it on the, on the TV, and once you get, but once you really get to see one of your idols, it's like, and then you just listening to all this, right. this realness. It's crazy, man. It's amazing. Well, I, I'm yeah. glad to have you all here, Craig, Daryl, and I'm going to listen to my '70s playlist. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I'm about to throw on the Curtis Mayfield. Make, make, make sure you send that to me and you share that with me. Okay. Yeah. And, I got and, you. You know, in the meantime, I know I'm definitely gonna be tuning in to the Deuce on HBO every yeah. Sunday at 9 p.m. All right, everybody, that's our episode for today. I'd like to thank you for tuning in. This is For the Record. I'm Rob Markman. See you next week. Peace.